Hey everyone, Chris here. So, I'm not going to make you wait until halfway through the video. The spell in D&D that does the most damage is Spike Growth. Now, this requires that the players do some planning to make that happen, but with some setup, Spike Growth can outdamage every other spell in the game, even spells like Meteor Swarm. And you don't need to be 17th level either. So, here's Spike Growth, and I'm just going to cover the basics first before I explain how to shred enemies to goo with this spell. It's an action to cast, has 150 foot range, which is really good, uses concentration, and lasts up to 10 minutes, though most of the time you're not going to need it for more than the length of a combat. You pick a point on the ground, and the area 20 feet around that point sprouts hard spikes and thorns, so we're talking 40 feet across. Now, there are multiple official methods regarding how to represent an area of effect spell on a battle map, so depending which your DM uses, the spike growth might look like this, or it might look like this on the battle map. The area is considered difficult terrain, and that means moving one foot through a spike growth requires two feet of speed. When a creature moves into or within the area of a spike growth, it takes 2d4 piercing damage for every five feet it travels. There is no saving throw, and since this piercing damage comes from a spell effect, you don't need to worry about a creature's possible resistance or immunity to piercing damage from a non-magical source. The area is camouflaged to look natural, so a creature that doesn't see the area when the spell is cast needs to make a wisdom perception check against your spell DC to recognize the terrain is hazardous before they enter it. Of course, if you cast it during combat, they will probably see that area. I generally recommend this spell to any spellcaster that can get it, which includes druids, rangers, Dao genie patron warlocks, and if you're a nature domain cleric, or a circle of the land arctic or mountain druid, you will get spike growth automatically prepared. So the very basic strategy for this spell is when you cast it, you want to get like a number of enemies somewhere within the middle of the area of effect. Ideally creatures that can't fly and that need to move up to you. So, for example, here's a bugbear, and it wants to get close to us to use its morning star, but because it's difficult terrain, it's going to need to take the dash action to get out of spike growth, which would prevent it from attacking on that turn. It's also going to take 8d4 damage, which is 20 damage on average, which is most of the bugbear's hit points. Now, it could stay where it is and throw a javelin, but we're talking 5 damage on average instead of 11 from its morning star, and it's likely going to have disadvantage on the attack due to range, so it's really a no-win scenario for that bugbear. So even with this very basic strategy, Spike Growth is a very good spell. Not a huge damage spell though, but it's a good mix of damage and battlefield control. A common strategy to get more out of Spike Growth is to mix it with some kind of force movement. So if you're a Dao Genie Patron Warlock, you might take Repelling Blast as an invocation, and then you would hit the bugbear with an Eldritch Blast, and then you can push it 10 feet, and the spike growth will add 44 to the damage of the blast. That's an additional 10 damage. Since Dao Patron Warlocks can also add bludgeoning damage to an Eldritch Blast, it opens up the option to take the Crusher feet, so you could get another 5 feet of movement. So you might push the bugbear 10 feet, then pull it 5 feet back towards the middle of the spike growth, and now you're adding 15 damage on average, and the bugbear is still stuck in the middle of the spell effect on their turn. A Swarm Keeper Ranger might use Gathered Swarm for 15 feet of force movement, and there's enough kinds of force movement that I won't bother listing them, but force movement is a great way to get more out of this spell. You can also push enemies who dashed out of the spell effect back in. You start utilizing these kinds of strategies, and Spike Growth goes from being a very good spell to being a great spell. Not broken, though, but it can be broken. So, here is how you break Spike Growth and make it the most damaging spell in D&D. So, let's say we have an enemy right here, and we'll say it's Grast, the Demon Prince. So, our character with Spike Growth casts it right here. And it doesn't matter if your DM uses circles or squares for the area of effect, works just as well either way. Then party member number two is going to grapple Grast. Now, the great thing about grappling is that it's an opposed ability check, meaning armor class doesn't matter, and legendary resistances don't matter, and you can make build decisions that pretty much guarantee that the grapple is going to work. More on that later. Now, we're going to use the grappling rules from the player's handbook. They say that when you move, you can drag or carry the grapple creature with you, but your speed is halved. Unless a creature is two or more sizes smaller than you, now, Grast is large, so our speed is going to be halved. 
Now, I should mention right now that some DMs will allow you to drag a grapple creature with a movement of a mount, or even if you're moved with force movement. But we are talking about murky rules territory, so I want to stick with our grappler using their own speed to move. Then the rules aren't ambiguous. This should work. So now I'm going to show you how to break the heck out of this spell and do more damage to Grast than a Meteor Swarm. A lot more. So we're going to start simple. Our grappler has a base speed of 30, so they can drag Grast a total of 15 feet. That is 64 or 15 points of damage on average. By the way, the math here is really easy. 5 feet of movement equals 5 points of average damage. 100 feet of movement, you guessed it, 100 points of damage on average. But you know, 15 damage isn't all that much. So let's see how much we can increase that. So let's say we already cast a long strider spell on our grappler. Now their speed is 40, so they can move 20 feet while dragging. That's 20 damage. And let's say our grappler is a tabaxi. So now they can double their movement for their turn. And this doesn't require anything from your action economy. It doesn't use your action or a reaction or a bonus action. So it straight up doubles the 40 speed to 80 or 40 while dragging. And that's 40 damage. And that's not bad. Now, let's say we have a third party member. And on their turn, they had cast haste on the tabaxi grappler. Haste doubles your movement speed. So now we're doubling it twice, once from feline agility and again from haste. So 30 base speed plus 10 from long strider is 40. If we double it, it's now 80. If we double it again, it's now 160. And that's 80 feet of dragging for 80 damage. Now that is pretty great damage. That's 32 D4, by the way. Now, if you're thinking you don't have anywhere close to 80 feet to drag grass before leaving the spike growth, well, you can drag him here, then drag him back here, then back to here, then back to here, then here, then here, then here, then here, and we're right back where we started. Now, I said this would do more damage than Meteor Swarm, which does 40d6 damage with a saving throw for half. So that's 120 average damage on a failed save, 60 on a successful one. So if we assume, say, 50% chance of saving, that's 90 damage on average. And we're already in that territory. But here's the thing, we have just gotten started. One movement of 80 feet is 80 damage on average. But let's say we already had Grass grappled at the start of our turn. Maybe we had readied an action to grapple him when he came in range, and now it's our turn. Well, we can now use our action to dash, and we just added another 32d4 damage, and we're up to 160 points. Oh, and haste gives us an additional action. Now, we can only do a few things with that action, so let's see. We got one attack with an attack action. That's not so great. And then we could either dash, disengage, hide, or use an object. So we'll take the dash action. Add another 32d4, and we're up to 240 damage. No saving throw. Now, let's say our Dabaxi has two levels in Fighter. Well, now they have Action Surge. So, they'll Action Surge to dash. That's another 32d4. Now we're up to 320 points of damage. And let's say we have two levels in Rogue. Well, that's Cunning Action, which gives us a bonus Action Dash option. That's another 32d4. And we're up to 400 damage. That's 160 D4, by the way. Grast has 346 hit points total. He's dead. No saving throw, no legendary resistance. His damage immunity doesn't come into play because the damage is magical. And if our DM uses circles instead of squares on the battle map, this is not a problem. Dash here, then here, then here, and so on. Dead demon prince. Now, let's say this character here is a creation bard, and we happen to have our dancing item, say, right here. Now that Dabaxi's base move speed is increased by 10 feet, that makes 400 damage, 500 damage instead. Now you might very reasonably be thinking at this moment that, sure, 500 damage is an absolutely huge amount of damage to be inflicting in a round, but there are a ton of what-ifs here, and this is typical whiteboard optimizing where in an actual game, you should never expect this kind of result. Here's where I tell you that we tested this strategy in an actual game. Here's what happened when we faced the big bad of the adventure. Bye bye. Look, Chris. <laughs> Chris, this is oh, no. this this is the perfect storm here. 
because I'm right next to the uh, to the spike growth. I'm next to the dancing object, which gives me ten more movement. Yep. I'm hasted. I have my feline agility, and I'm action dashing. I'm bonus action dashing, and I'm haste action dashing. That gives me um, nine hundred and sixty feet of movement. <laughs> And so with grappling, that's 480 feet of movement. And in terms of D4, that is 192 D4. So I'm going to roll that. I, 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 you don't even need to roll. That's enough to do. One, one second. No, we're rolling, rolling it. We're rolling it. All one. D4. <laughs> Baboosh. 490, 490 damage. damage. I think you got him. I think he's dead. Now, you'll be able to see the whole game where we tested this grapple technique on the CMCC Builds YouTube channel. So I'll link that in the video description if you want to check it out. But notice how close to the average damage we did. And I say we because it is a strategy that is a team effort requiring three characters. The reason the damage is close to the average isn't a fluke. The more dice you add, the closer to the average you're going to get. That's how the law of averages works. And as you saw, we are rolling a lot of dice. It's so many dice that if you actually play with physical dice, you might actually want to talk to your DM about some method to simplify it by either using the average roll or roll a tenth as many dice and multiply or something like that because rolling this many dice and adding them all up is going to take a long time. Okay, so 500 damage on average, but what if I told you that at a lot of tables, this damage could be doubled really easily because it can and because that's what I promised on the thumbnail. Well, I've brought up this issue many times on this channel, so I'm going to sound like a broken record to regular viewers, but if you are a DM, I generally don't recommend letting players choose their own magic items. In fact, if I'm your player, I'm going to recommend to you not to allow us to do that. And this includes item crafting rules, or magic item shops, or magic item wish lists, because if you optimize, there are often broken combinations that you can exploit. Case in point, Boots of Speed. These can be activated up to 10 minutes before the devastating interaction, and they straight out double our speed, which was already doubled once with feline agility and a second time with a haste spell, and now we double it yet again. And 200 dice of damage becomes 400 dice of damage. And our average damage jumps to 1,000. Now that's not 1,000 damage if we roll well, or 1,000 maximum damage. That's 1,000 damage on average. And because of the law of averages, we will get very close to that number. Might be 950, might be 1,050. No published monsters have that kind of hit points. This automatically kills any creature, even challenge rating 30. There's no saving throw. There's nothing they can do unless they're immune to the grappled condition. And that's a fairly rare ability, even at high challenge ratings. I should also add that even if the creature is benefiting from a freedom of movement spell, Freedom of movement does not make you immune to grapple. It just allows you to escape a grapple easily. But if we do this, then we can drag them and then they're too dead to escape. Now, all of this might ring some kind of bell for regular viewers because I have a video called Grapple Death Squad that utilizes a similar strategy. And these two friends and I deliberately made characters to test the Grapple Death Squad but you might also notice the damage here is higher than I promised in that video. Also, our grappler could pretty much guarantee successful grapples through multiple methods. And there was flight available if they needed to grapple a flying enemy and drag them down to the spike growth. And a lot of other contingencies that we planned for. And the character that cast haste had superior protection against losing that spell. Because there's one rule to casting haste. Don't lose the spell. So... Although I think Grapple Death Squad is a good combination of three builds that use teamwork, this new team has significant mechanical improvements, so they're not really Grapple Death Squad anymore. I think I'm going to call them Squad Abling Ultimate Catastrophic Ends. So if your players say 
they're bringing the sauce with their builds, then they probably watched the next video that I'm going to release, where I'm going to show you how to make the sauce. By the way, those other two players, who are Ramen Goblin and Math Guy Dave, became friends of mine because we play D&D together all the time, because they are members of my Patreon. And since I'm calling them out, here's some other friends of mine who play D&D with me on a regular basis as members of my Patreon. Check out the link to my Patreon in the video description if you would like to join and be a member. We have Airhead, and Alex R, and Vo, Bloody9, Etherazone, CJ, Chris C, Coral, Dank Train, Dewey Cheetahman Howe, Douglas Reynolds, Eden the DM, Eric Wasserman, Evan Getting, FBK05, Galad Artsy, Gishlife, Lightfoot, Heisenberger, Jay Gemmel, James Mackla, James Sprague, Jean Baptiste Blanchette, Jiriru, John Matera, Jonathan Zucker, Joseph Van Horn, Justin Times, Lars V, Mark D, Mr. Brett, PCZ, Quicksilver, HG80, Scott Parsons, Sig, Speed Shadow, Thunderlock, and William Whittles. And until next time, I am going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I will talk to you soon.